Hi, everyone. I am so excited because I am speaking with author Kelly Bowen about this brand new book. Look at this cover. Yeah. Too. <laughs> and that way we get to see it because I don't know if they're going to see this <laughs> the right way, but they can see the <laughs> camera. I could not believe how good this book was. Oh my God. Every single word of this book. I kept telling people, I'm like, I am reading, and I have read a lot of historical fiction, World War II. It's not like I'm not, like this is not my first one, but I loved how you wrote this book. And I am telling you, it's the first book I've read of yours, but I'm, I'm going down. I'm going deep into your books now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. And so was this your first historical fiction? I was looking on your website. It looks like it was, right? Yes. Yeah. So okay. The Paris Apartment is my first historical fiction. All my previous books have been historical romance. So a bit of a departure for me, but I've always had that World War II book kind of uh, floating around in the back of my head for a long time. But when I pitched it to my editor and they gave me the chance to write it, I was just so grateful, so excited. We're going to let you tell the backstory, but I have pictures here because this is personal for you too. This isn't, you know, you, you have family that was involved in World War II. Yes. Like so that's kind of how that that story that was wandering around in my head yeah. that's kind of how it started wandering around in my head is that uh, you that's me oh yeah when I was little <laughs> so tell us tell us tell us about it uh, so uh both my grandfathers served uh in world war ii actually my great uncle served in world war one and um being kind of the amateur historian in my family I get all the boxes that come from attics and mm -hmm. basements of old things that Kelly might like and in one of those boxes actually my great uncle who uh served in world war one he was killed in France they sent his uh war diary home among some other personal effects and I have that so what I read it um years ago and he was very descriptive of his experience it really just everything that he was experiencing that he saw that he felt like right up until the time where he was killed obviously my grandfather uh who served in the rcme i was very close with him but he never spoke of the war ever 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 it's like it just didn't exist but interestingly enough, from the time I was little, he taught me about radios and that was kind of his wheelhouse. And that's what he brought back from the war. So by the time I was 10, I was building circuit boards. Uh, he taught me how to, you know, get the right capacitor and the resistor to read the radio schematics. Um, I used to build little radios or little circuit boards for science fairs. No one would believe that I would do it. It was <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But yeah, so that's kind of how he shared his war experience with me, uh, which is completely different. Just didn't talk about the war, but here's what I brought back and here's what I can teach you. But he also had a huge collection of World War II books, maps um, that I remember reading when I was a kid, which is probably way over my head. That's really what got me interested in the conflict. And that's what's been rattling around my head for a long time. Well, what I love about this is if I said I read a lot, okay, I've read a lot of historical fiction. If you have never read a historical fiction about out London, Paris, if you want it broken down, like I thought when I was reading it, I was like, I wish this would have been my first one. I learned so much from you, even though I know you had to move some things around because you have to a little bit. And I read about that. You were so good. At, I was like, as I'm reading, I'm like, oh my God, she's so good at describing. I, I knew where I was when I was reading it. And I was like, I, I knew some things, but there were also some things I didn't know. So I really, I was like, oh, if this would have been my first one. I think I could have read some of the others a little bit easier. That's what I loved about your writing. I, it, it was simple, but I knew where I was. This is four points of view, which always scares me. I'm like, no. It I'm scares me too. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm 56. I cannot remember four people, two timelines, four people. I might not be able to do this, but it was so perfect. I could, I had no trouble following any of this. Timelines go from 2017 and then back to Paris and London, like I said, a little bit, but basically Paris. So how did you come up with, how did you figure out that that was the timelines you were going to use, that you were going to go jump forward like that? When I wrote this, the story is basically kind of about the choices that people make um, and then how it affects, well, how it affects future generations even. And so I wanted the choices that were happening in the past narrative to be reflected on what was happening in the present narrative and how that kind of guided them or, or steered them. And when I was doing my research, I read a lot of memoirs as opposed to just straight history books, because I find reading memoirs 
Uh, um, even though they may be slanted or biased, they're real. The person talks about their real experiences, what they smelled, what they felt, what, what they were thinking, as opposed to just a list of dates and times. So I tried to uh, kind of apply that to my book. So hopefully draw the reader into feeling, being, being in the action, as opposed to just reading what was happening. Absolutely. So I tried to do that. I, I thought that your first chapters were like pure perfection. I always hesitate, like when you're getting different points of view, in the very beginning, you're like trying to find that voice but I found it like right I was like you know after about 50 pages I'm like I can't believe I already know these characters it's incredible that is usually not what happens it usually takes me halfway through the book figure it all out you know where everybody is you know but that's not how it was and I kept thinking I got to tell her that I have to tell Kelly how perfect the beginning of this book is so oh well thank you very very much <laughs> I want to hear how you say Leah her whole name because I have it in my head, like Ariella. Aurelia. Aurelia. Okay. Yes. I yes. I read it the full name because she went by Leah a lot. Like when I yes. read the full name, I'm like, why am I not hearing this name? That's so pretty. I love that. I loved that name. Yes. And I shortened it to Leah for exactly that reason. Cause it's as a reader, it's easy to read. Yeah, right. It's, it is. It is easier to read. And I felt like I knew where these characters were along the way. I wasn't confused as to like, where, wait, where are they? Where are they right now? But explain to us about the Ritz, because that was the most fascinating part to me is learning like what was going on during World War II in Paris at that hotel. The, the Luftwaffe, the, the German Air Force, um, well, when they, when they marched into Paris, like Paris was spared what London got or what Rotterdam got or what uh, Stalingrad, like it wasn't bombed to pieces when, when, they, when they occupied it. And they marched in and everything was very preserved. Um, Paris had pretty much emptied by then, people had fled. So when they marched in, they simply took over the best hotels, the best places, best chateaus, for, and set up their headquarters in those places. And they did that in other in other places too. Um, so the Air Force took over the Ritz. At the time, the Ritz was a very swanky place. It was kind of a mixture. It's where all the best artists hang out, hung out, all the best intellectuals hang out, all the very best socialites hung out. Like it was a real mixture of, of kind of what sort of what defined Paris almost. And a lot of those people lived there. And so when... Um, they moved in when the Nazis moved in, they got bounced out of their out of their rooms for the most part. Uh, Coco Chanel lived there. She got bounced out of her room. That was kind of their home base. And people still came to the restaurants and people still came to the cafes and the bars. So the bars that I talk about in the book and the bartenders, like they existed, they were real. The suites that I existed, the Imperial Suite and all that, those are all real. You can't see them how they were because the hotels since been renovated. Yeah, they, they all existed. That was their headquarters. Now, have you ever been there? To the Ritz? Like, have you been I, to Paris? I've been to Paris. I have not been to the Ritz. I did not stay there when I was in Paris. Well, I just meant like, did you see? I've never been to Paris. And of course, that's always like, that is on my list of now a very far away list. Of where you yeah. <laughs> no, I've been to Paris. I've been to, uh, been to France. I've traveled. I, I love the country. I love the city. Uh, but I did not stay at the Ritz. I've seen the Ritz from the outside and wondered what it would be like to stay at the Ritz. Okay, so you have seen it. Like you've seen the, even the outside. Like, okay. Well, uh, yes, yes. Okay. But I have not been inside. I never went into the, the Imperial Suite. I relied completely <laughs> on old photographs and old descriptions. Uh, Hemingway was very profuse in his descriptions. True. I never thought about that. That's true. Yeah. It was. Very cool. So... What I also loved about this story was the women, what we learned about how the women contributed, because we know, you know, the men were fighting, we know what they were doing, but I love books that talk about what the women could do and how well they did it. And especially our main character, like just how well they, because I can't even imagine, right? Can we even imagine in our while, like how we would deal? We can't, we can't. <laughs> but that they found their way to help. It was, uh, that's just what I loved about the story so much. So tell me how you did that. Tell me what you were thinking. Like, of course you wanted to write about the strong women that were helping the resistance. Yeah, so again, when I started researching and I started going through the memoirs, um, I have some of them here. So I started with this one, uh, which is Wolves at the Door. And that's for, um, Virginia Hall's story, codename Pauline. So just a bunch of memoirs about, um, this is Pearl Witherington's story. And there's many more, these are just two examples, talking about their experiences. And it's funny because 
they only wrote their memoirs much, much later in life. Like when the war was over, uh, the women who served in combat behind enemy lines working for the SOE or even the women that were at Bletchley Park, they, it ended, it was never spoken of again. And only now, like now there's more documents being declassified, like they've timed out. So we, we're starting to get a much broader picture of just exactly how much they did when before their their stories were buried. Right, especially Bletchley Park. Like we know that we know the movie, I'm trying to think of the name of it. That's the top of my head. The one with um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, uh, yes. It's on the tip of my tongue. No, I'm like, it's right there. Anyway, we, we know those stories. But what were the women doing? You brought forth like what the women were doing. And I love that because it's like we knew his, we knew what they were doing. But what were the women doing? Everything. Every, everything. <laughs> everything. I'm, not to, I'm like stuttering because I don't want to tell too much. I'm trying to hold back because I want that. I want everybody to experience it the way I did. I will say this about the ending. I thought it was ended. You know, I was like, okay. And then you hit me with <laughs> <laughs> and I just burst into tears and I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And then I could go to sleep and I laid there a while and I was like, I love when a book, it's happy tears, you know, and I love when I get happy tears like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Then I've done my job in making you care about the characters enough that yeah. you care. Exactly, that you do care. Who was the most fun character to write? Oh, because I was thinking about that as a reader, you know, sometimes we get attached. And of course, Leah, like, of course, you're getting attached to her. But then I love Sophie. And, you know, I could get I could go to the other characters and be like, okay, I can get you know, like, I was having fun with all of them. But was Leah your favorite? Or did you have another one that you were like, Oh, yes, I get to write this today? I, no, this is a hard question. It's like picking <laughs> a favorite child. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> These are the things I um, think about when I'm reading. <laughs> I did. You know, I really liked writing the character of Sophie. She was um, fun. She had spark. She had, you know, a little bit more like grit, I want to say, you know. Yeah, she she almost she had a chip on her shoulder, you know, she'd been told what she should be doing, what she couldn't do, what she should like for her whole life and she just was out to prove them all wrong. Um yeah, I'm not going to say too much about her story cuz I don't want to spoil it, but you were kind of like, you know, sorry people, we're just, you know, we don't want to tell you cuz it's such a great story. I just want you to experience it. But yeah, Leah was so much fun. I don't know. Like I love that she always had uh, she would come across one way, but she always like she was so smart when she was. Yes. And I love that because as a reader, I'm buying into her. I'm like, I'm the I'm like, wow, she is so good. Like, no wonder they think she's part of that. No wonder they think she's with them because she was so good at it. She didn't make it look obvious. Like some of the other girls, you know, were that were making it too obvious. She knew how to hold back and kind of play them right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they each character I wanted to make very different, so they kind of a foil for each other. Yeah. And especially for um, Estelle and Sophie at the end, those differences that perhaps at the beginning of the war would have completely like kept them completely divergent actually ended up bringing them together. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What, what, are you, what are you writing right now? Are you going to do historical fiction? What are you going to do? Are you going on with your series? Is this, a, uh, this is not a series? No, this is a standalone uh, okay. and it will remain a standalone as far, as far as I know. Um, I'm writing a new um, historical fiction. Um, this one's going to be also set uh, in World War II. Uh, it's going to be set in both the Netherlands and France. And it's kind of going to, um, it's kind of inspired by, well, kind of, it is inspired by the stories of the Jedburgh teams that were dropped behind enemy lines um, in advance of Operation Overlord and Market Garden, the resistance uh, cells that they worked with. Uh, I can't, when is that coming out? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just writing. <laughs> that one will Rich. probably have a publication date late 2022 or early 2023. Uh, I'm not I'm not 100% positive yet. Sorry. Well, are you still writing those series like at the same time? Like I don't you know, how do you do your series? Yeah, no, I I'm not writing uh, historical romance right now. I'm just I'm focused on just writing. I'm not good at writing multiple books. The authors oh. that can write multiple books at a time, they amaze me. I don't know how they do it. I I'm not one of those authors. I'll finish this one. And then I've got, I've got all sorts of ideas for both historical fiction and historical romance. So I loved writing my historical romance. I love writing historical fiction. Uh, they each have their own 
absolute joys to to write so yeah we'll take it we'll take it one book at a time <laughs> no i don't i know i hear about authors especially series authors for some reason they're like oh i'm you know planning this one out halfway through this series you know got this and i'm like oh my my brain there's no way like i would never be able to do that I'm yeah like, so when you're writing a series uh like a historical romance series you'll be writing one book but you may be editing the the, the one before it and then promoting the one before it that's just coming out now so <laughs> Well, I don't think I even mentioned that this book comes out on Tuesday. This it video does. will come out before the book. So you can pre-order it on Amazon and have it delivered or audio or, you know, Kindle. You can get it right away. And I am, right? Oh, am I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it can. It, yeah, you can order it. It's available uh, at whatever your favorite retailer is, either e-format, yes. audiobook, uh, print. I am so happy I met you. I'm so happy I read this book. It was, it's going to stay with me a long time. I can tell oh, you thank you. story will stay with me. And so here it is, everyone. Thank you. And can we talk with the next one whenever? <laughs> yes, please. Awesome. All right. Well, we will talk soon then. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.